Well, good evening, and thank you for coming to St Andrew the Great this evening. Uh, and uh, if you're just coming in, do feel free to take your seats in the gallery. We are here with a packed house tonight. It's wonderful to see everybody here for what promises to be a really stimulating event. And the title of tonight's event is The Origins of the Universe, Has Hawking Eliminated God? And our thanks to St Andrew the Great for hosting the event tonight. My name is Justin Brawley. I'm the chairperson for the event tonight. I run a faith discussion programme on Premier Christian Radio, who, along with Damaris and UCCF, are sponsoring the Reasonable Faith Tour. I don't know if anyone read the Times headline about a year ago. Uh, it was actually published on September the 2nd. And I have, probably a bit small for most of you to see here, but this is uh, the, the Times headline that read on its front page, Hawking, God did not create universe. And uh, that was a story that went around the world at the time. It was published on the eve of the uh, publication of Stephen Hawking's best-selling book, his most recent book, The Grand Design. And so it essentially suggested that uh, contemporary physics has eliminated God as a cause of the universe. Well, is that the case? Tonight, we'll hear why one, even two people think that it ain't necessarily so. Um, later in the evening, we're going to be joined in conversation by uh, a Cambridge physicist by background, uh, but he's been ordained for a long time as well, the Reverend Dr. Rodney Holder. Uh, but our main speaker this evening is a philosopher by background. He currently holds the position of Research Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in California. He's the author of over 30 books and over 150 peer-reviewed academic articles. He regularly engages in high-profile debates with leading atheists around the world. And uh, he's speaking tonight, as I said earlier, on the origins of the universe. Has Hawking eliminated God? Please welcome Professor William Lane Craig. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a delight to be here with you this evening. Cambridge is a sort of scholar's heaven on earth, I think. And whenever we've had the opportunity to spend time here in Cambridge on research leave or even simply visiting, my wife Jan and I have so enjoyed um, being in this city and at this uh, university. Uh, in Cambridge. So it's a delight to be back with you again this evening and then tomorrow for the debate at the uh, Cambridge Union. Quantum physics. The very term is enough to send a chill up your spine and to send the theologians ducking into foxholes. Stephen Hawking is the quantum king of popular culture. His brief history of time has sold nine million copies. The New York Times has called Hawking the most revered scientist since Einstein. So when Stephen Hawking says in his most recent book, The Grand Design, that quantum physics has made the need for a creator and designer superfluous, the temptation is to hoist the white flag of surrender. When Hawking goes even further, and says on the recent television program, Curiosity, that modern cosmology furnishes a proof of atheism, then the average believer may feel deeply shaken in his faith. But do these bold assertions bear scrutiny? Sir Martin Rees of the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge and the Astronomer Royal is not impressed. In an interview in the Independent of September of last year, he said candidly, and I quote, Stephen Hawking is a remarkable person whom I've known for 40 years. And for that reason, any oracular statement he makes gets exaggerated publicity. I know Stephen Hawking well enough to know that he has read very little philosophy and even less theology, and so I don't think we should attach any weight to his views on this topic. This very morning, I had the extraordinary opportunity of meeting Professor Rees on the train from London to Cambridge. 
and we spoke briefly about uh, the conference this evening, and he underscored uh, what he had said a year ago and his skepticism about Hawking's claims. Well, tonight I propose that we take a closer look at what Hawking has to say about God's role in the creation of the universe and see if his claims bear scrutiny. Hawking and Mladenov opened their book, The Grand Design, with a series of profound questions. What is the nature of reality? Where did this all come from? Did the universe need a creator? And then they say, traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophy has not kept up with modern developments in science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Now, as a professional philosopher, I could only roll my eyes at the audacity of such a statement. Two scientists who have, to all appearances, little acquaintance with philosophy, are prepared to pronounce an entire discipline dead and to insult their faculty colleagues in philosophy at Caltech and Cambridge University, many of whom, like Michael Redhead and D.H. Meller, are eminent philosophers of science for supposedly failing to keep up. Their pronouncement is not merely amazingly condescending, but also outrageously naive. The man who claims to have no need of philosophy is the man most apt to be deceived by it. You might therefore anticipate that Hawking and Mladenov's subsequent exposition of their favorite theories would be underpinned by a host of unexamined philosophical presuppositions. And that expectation is in fact borne out. Their claims about laws of nature, the possibility of miracles, scientific determinism, and the illusion of free will are all asserted with only the thinnest of justification. Now, I don't have time to talk about these issues this evening, but should you be interested, I've commented on them in some detail uh, at my website, reasonablefaith.org. Just look at question of the week number 181 for a discussion. Clearly, Mladenov and Hawking are up to their necks in philosophical questions. What you might not expect, however, is that after pronouncing the death of philosophy, Hawking and Mladenov should themselves then plunge immediately into a philosophical discussion of scientific realism versus anti-realism. I thought philosophy was supposed to be dead, but the first third of their book is not about current scientific theories at all, but is a disquisition on the history and philosophy of science. I found this section to be the most interesting and mind-boggling of the entire book. Let me explain. Having set aside a Monday afternoon to read uh, Hawking and Mladenov's book, I spent that morning working through an article from Blackwell's Contemporary Debates in Metaphysics on a philosophical viewpoint known as ontological pluralism. Ontological pluralism. Now, what is that? Ontological pluralism is a view in an area of philosophy whose name sounds like stuttering, meta-metaphysics, or as it's sometimes called, meta-ontology. This is philosophy at its most ethereal. Ontology is the study of being, uh, or of what exists, the nature of reality. Meta-ontology is one step higher. It inquires whether ontological disputes are meaningful and how best to resolve them. Ontological pluralism holds that there really is no right answer to many ontological questions, such as, do composite objects exist? 
According to the ontological pluralist, these are just different ways of describing reality, and none of these is more correct or accurate than another. There literally is no fact of the matter to answer these questions. So, if you were to ask, for example, is there such a thing as the moon? The ontological pluralist would say that the question has no objective answer. It's not true that the moon exists. And it's not true that the moon does not exist. There just is no fact of the matter about whether there is such a thing as the moon. Ontological pluralism is thus a radical view which is defended by only a handful of contemporary philosophers. Imagine my astonishment, therefore, to find Hawking and Mladenov espousing ontological pluralism, without, of course, being aware of the name, as their answer to the question, what is the nature of reality? They call their view model-dependent realism. They explain that models are just different ways of interpreting our sense perceptions. On their view, there is no objective reality out there uh, to which our models of the world more or less accurately correspond. Mladenov and Hawking are thus, in fact, extreme anti-realists. For example, contrasting young Earth creationism and the Big Bang Theory, Hawking and Mladenov claim that while the Big Bang Theory is, quote, more useful, nevertheless, neither model can be said to be more real than the other. Now think of it, this great champion of modern cosmology thinks that the Big Bang model is no more real or accurate than the creation of the world 6,000 years ago. Now you can't help wonder, but what sort of argument would justify adopting so radical a view? All that Mladenov and Hawking have to offer is the fact that if we were, uh, say, inhabitants of a virtual reality controlled by alien beings, then there would be no way for us to tell that we were in the simulated world, and so we would have no reason to doubt its reality. The trouble with this sort of argument is that it doesn't exclude that there are, in this case, two competing models of the world. One, the alien's model, and the other, our model, and one of the models is real, and the other one is illusory, even if we can't tell which is which. Moreover, the fact that our observations are model dependent doesn't imply that we cannot have knowledge of the way the world is, much less that there is no way the world is. For example, a layperson entering the Cavendish laboratory might see that there's a piece of machinery on the lab table, but he would not see that there is an interferometer on the lab table since he lacks the theoretical knowledge to recognize it as such. A caveman entering the laboratory wouldn't even see that there's a piece of machinery on the table since he lacks the concept of a machine. But that does nothing to undermine the objective truth of the lab technician's observation that there is an interferometer on the table. Hawking and Mladenov, not content with ontological pluralism, really go off the deep end when they assert, and I quote, there is no model independent test of reality. It follows that a well-constructed model creates a reality of its own, end quote. Now this is an assertion of ontological relativity, the view that reality itself is different for persons having different models. If you're Fred Hoyle, then the universe really has existed eternally in a steady state. But if you're Roger Penrose, then the universe really did begin with a Big Bang. 
If you're the ancient physician Galen, blood really does not circulate through the human body. But if you're William Harvey, who discovered circulation, it really does. Now, such a view seems crazy and is made so only more so by Hawking and Mladenov's claim that the model itself somehow creates its respective reality. It hardly needs to be said that no such conclusion follows from there being no model independent test of the way the world is. All of this is, in any case, somewhat beside my main point. The main point is that despite their claim to speak as scientific torchbearers of knowledge, what Hawking and Mladenov are engaged in is philosophy. The most important conclusions drawn in their book are philosophical, not scientific. Why then do they pronounce philosophy dead and claim as scientists to be bearing the torch of discovery? Simply because that enables them to cloak their amateurish philosophizing with the mantle of scientific authority and so avoid the hard work of actually arguing for their positions rather than merely asserting their philosophical viewpoints. For that reason, I am frankly not terribly impressed when scientists begin to pronounce on questions of philosophy and theology. For when they do so, they are speaking outside of their area of specialization, and their opinions have no more value than the opinions of an untutored layman. Indeed, they are untutored laymen when it comes to these questions, for scientists typically lack any training in philosophy and theology. Now, with that in mind, let's look now more closely at Hawking and Mladenov's answer to the profound questions they initially posed. Where did the universe come from? Did the universe need a creator? Why does something exist rather than nothing? Their answer to these questions involves an appeal to the no boundary model of the origin of the universe, which was popularized by Hawking in his best selling book, A Brief History of Time. Our authors in the grand design simply expound the model without adducing any evidence for it or mentioning any of the many alternative models to it. Nor do they respond to the criticism that the so-called imaginary time featured in the model is physically unintelligible and therefore merely a mathematical trick useful for avoiding the cosmological singularity which appears in classical theories at the beginning of the universe. Still, their exposition is not without interest with regard to the beginning of the universe. For example, they write on pages 134 to 5, the realization that time can behave like another dimension of space means one can get rid of the problem of time having a beginning in a similar way in which we got rid of the edge of the world. Suppose the beginning of the universe was like the south pole of the earth with degrees of latitude playing the role of time. As one moves north, the circles of constant latitude representing the size of the universe would expand. The universe would start as a point at the South Pole, but the South Pole is much like any other point. To ask what happened before the beginning of the universe would become a meaningless question because there is nothing south of the South Pole. In this picture, space-time has no boundary. The same laws of nature hold at the South Pole as in other places." End quote. This passage is fascinating because it represents a rather different interpretation of the model than we had in A Brief History of Time. Let me explain. 
In his model, Hawking employs imaginary numbers, like the square root of negative one, for the time variable in his equations in order to get rid of the initial cosmological singularity, which is the boundary of space-time in the standard Big Bang model. The initial segment of space-time, instead of terminating in a point, like a cone, is rounded off, rather like a, a badminton shuttlecock. The south pole of this rounded off surface is like any other point on that surface. Hence, the idea that there is no boundary. Since imaginary time behaves like a dimension of space, Hawking interpreted his no boundary universe to just be. But in the grand design, the South Pole is interpreted to represent the beginning point to both time and the universe. Despite the fact that imaginary time behaves like another spatial dimension, Hawking allows the circles of latitude to play the role of time which has a beginning point at the South Pole. When Hawking speaks of uh, the problem of time having a beginning, what he means, and I quote, is the age-old objection to the universe having a beginning, an objection which his model removes. So, what is that age-old objection? That objection, he says, is the question, what happened before the beginning of the universe? Now, Hawking is right that this question is meaningless on his model. But what he fails to mention is that the, the question is equally meaningless on the standard Big Bang model, since there is nothing prior to the initial cosmological singularity. On either model, the universe has an absolute temporal beginning. So the question isn't, what was there before the beginning of the universe? Rather, the real question is, why did the universe begin to exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? Hawking and Mladenov advocate what they call a top-down approach to this question. The idea here is to begin with our presently observed universe, characterized by the standard model of particle physics, and then calculate, given the no-boundary condition, the probability of the various histories allowed by quantum physics to reach our present state. The most probable history represents the history of our observable universe. Hawking and Mladenov claim that in this view, the universe appeared spontaneously from nothing. And by spontaneously, they appear to mean without a cause. But how does that follow from the model? The top-down approach calculates the probability of our observable universe given the no-boundary condition. The top-down approach doesn't calculate the probability that the no-boundary condition should exist in the first place. It just takes it for granted. Now, such a condition is not metaphysically or physically necessary. If the universe came into being uncaused from nothing, it could have any sort of conceivable spatio-temporal configuration, for nothingness or non-being has no properties, no constraints, is governed by no physical laws. Physics only begins at the South Pole in the no-boundary model. There isn't anything in the model that implies that that point came to be without a cause. Indeed, the idea that being could arise without a cause from non-being seems to be metaphysically absurd. In his recent interview on the television program Curiosity, Hawking goes yet a step further to argue that atheism is true because there is no time at which God could have created the universe since time began at the Big Bang. This is a terrible argument, however, since it just assumes without justification 
that causes must precede their effects in time. But philosophers frequently discuss cases in which cause and effect are simultaneous. That is to say, they occur at the same time. So why couldn't God's creating the universe be simultaneous with the universe's coming into being? Indeed, what could be more obvious? Of course, the universe's coming into being is simultaneous with God's creating it and bringing it into being. Now, if Hawking insists that the initial singularity in the standard model is not technically speaking a point in space-time, but is a boundary point of space-time, fine. We can still say that God's creating the universe was coincident with the universe's coming into being. That is to say, they occur together on the boundary of space-time. Besides, his model is supposed to have eliminated the boundary point of space-time in favor of an ordinary beginning point like the South Pole. So what's the problem? Hawking's attempt to invalidate theism is, I'm afraid, singularly unimpressive. Hawking and Mladenov seem to realize that they have not yet answered the question, why is there something rather than nothing? For they return to this question in their concluding chapter and give a quite different answer. There, they explain that there is a constant vacuum energy contained in empty space. And if the universe's positive energy associated with matter is evenly balanced by the negative energy associated with gravitation, then the universe can come spontaneously into being as a fluctuation of the energy in the vacuum, which by a clever sleight of hand, they say, we may as well call zero. Now this seems to be a very different account of the universe's origin, for it presupposes the reality of space and the energy in it. So it's puzzling when Mladenov and Hawking conclude, and I quote, because there is a law like gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing in the manner described in chapter six. Here, it's said that the nothingness spoken of in chapter six is not really nothingness after all, but is space filled with vacuum energy. But space filled with vacuum energy is hardly nothing, and certainly doesn't exist prior to the South Pole in the model. All this goes to reinforce the conviction that the no-boundary approach only describes the evolution of our universe from its origin at the South Pole to its present state, but is silent as to why the universe came to exist in the first place. What this implies is that Hawking hasn't even begun to address the question, why is there something rather than nothing? For nothing, in his vocabulary, does not have the traditional meaning of non-being, but rather means the quantum vacuum. Hawking and Mladenov's equivocal use of terms is painfully evident in their interview with the American television host Larry King on his program. Here is how it went. Hawking, gravity and quantum theory cause universes to be created spontaneously out of nothing. Larry King, who created the nothing? Where did the nothing come from? (laughs) Mladenov, according to quantum theory, there is no such thing as nothingness. Now, in this ridiculous exchange, Hawking is using nothing to refer to the quantum vacuum, while Mladenov is using it to mean non-being. And they avoid the tough question, Why is there something rather than nothing only by equivocating on the use of their terminology? In conclusion then, despite Hawking and Mladenov's constant sniping at religious belief throughout their book, I think there is actually genuine profit in it for religious believers, especially for those interested in natural theology. For the authors affirm and argue for 
an absolute beginning of time and the universe, which points ineluctably to a transcendent cause beyond the universe. Given the desperation and or irrelevancy of their proffered answers to the profound questions that motivated their inquiry, their book thus turns out to be quite supportive of the existence of a creator of the cosmos. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And um, having heard what Bill has had to say on uh, Hawking's arguments against God as a cause of the universe, we thought it would be interesting to hear from a Cambridge-based physicist by background. Uh, that is, of course, uh, the Reverend Dr. Rodney Holder, who is course director at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, which is based at St. Edmunds College here in Cambridge. He's also ordained, and he's going to come and uh, give some thoughts on the back of Bill's presentation tonight. Thank you, Rodney. Well, thank you very much, Justin, and it's uh, a great pleasure to be able to respond to Bill. Um, uh, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, this isn't, however, too much of a critique because I'm very much in sympathy with what uh, Professor Lane Craig has said. Um, but it seems to me there are two fundamental questions which mo modern cosmology poses which take us beyond the science itself into the realm of metaphysics, philosophy, or even theology. And they are, first of all, the indication that the universe had a beginning in time some 13.7 billion years ago, which uh, Bill has been talking about. And secondly, the fact that the constants which go into the laws of physics and the initial conditions of the universe at the Big Bang need to take the values they do to high degrees of accuracy in order for the universe to give rise to life and indeed to anything interesting at all. It seems that the idea of the universe having a beginning has presented a serious challenge to cosmologists in the modern world, especially cosmologists of an atheist persuasion. Einstein, who was more of a pantheist than an atheist, hated the idea and chose a particular value for the cosmological constant in order to make the universe static. Eddington, who was a Quaker, called the idea repugnant. But the most serious opposition came from a group of Cambridge cosmologists, Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondy, and Thomas Gold, who proposed the alternative of a, of a steady state universe. It was, in fact, Fred Hoyle who coined the phrase Big Bang in the first place as a term of abuse for the theory, because he believed that if the universe had a beginning in time, then it would need God to create it. And of course, as an atheist, Hoyle hated the very idea of that. And it seems that Hawking, uh, similarly today, uh, prefers an approach which attempts to do away with that first moment. Now, I agree with Professor Lane Craig that Hawking and other cosmologists have failed to come up with any convincing way of getting rid of the beginning. But the point I would like to make is that even if they had, they would not have answered the fundamental question addressed by the Christian doctrine of creation. This is indeed the question why there is something rather than nothing. But that is to say that the Christian doctrine of creation is much more about the ontological origin of the universe than its temporal origin. As St. Thomas Aquinas recognized, even if there is a chain of cause and effect which goes back into the infinite past, that infinite chain still needs a first cause outside the chain altogether. So the question is, why does the chain of cause and effect exist at all? And it's because of this kind of argument that St. Thomas said that we can know God exists from reason alone. However, he said that we cannot know from reason alone whether the universe had a beginning in time, although he believed that it did, on the basis of his interpretation of Scripture. The basic point of the argument is that the universe is contingent. It may or may not have existed in the first place, and given that it exists, it could have been different from what it is. 
Its existence can be explained if there is a necessary being who creates it. And that is at least part of what we mean by God. To say that God is necessary means that he cannot not exist. He must exist and is eternally existent. And God, so understood, explains the existence of everything else. Uh, this point was in fact recognised by none other, than, none other than Stephen Hawking himself back in a brief history of time when he asked the question, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe precisely? Martin Rees and Dennis Sharma, the supervisor of Hawking and uh, uh, of, uh, of Martin Rees, um, all recognise uh, this very point, even though none of those cosmologists was a religious believer. A further important point from the Christian doctrine is that there is no particular vested interest in the first moment. Rather, God is involved in every moment. God sustains the universe in being, moment by moment, and as St. Augustine said, the universe would collapse into nothing if God ceased to will the universe's existence. So the upshot of all this is that the Christian doctrine of creation is completely untouched, even if uh, Hawking or others managed to explain away the beginning, which, as Professor Lane Craig says, they are very far from doing. The other big issue, though, is the fine-tuning of the universe, and I think that uh, this is uh, perhaps even more hard to explain uh, if you are an atheist than the universe the universe is beginning. Um, the universe seems in numerous ways to be designed so that life could develop in it at some stage of its evolution. The constants of the laws of physics, the initial conditions of the Big Bang need to be what they are in order to give rise to life. And the very interesting thing about this is that it was discovered by cosmologists with no religious axe to grind. For example, Brandon Carter who coined the phrase anthropic principle to describe it. Martin Rees was another pioneer uh, of discovering the fine-tuning. Now, for an atheist, it seems to me there are two main options to solve this problem. The first is to say that cosmologists like Carter are wrong and you, can, you cannot vary the constants of physics. Maybe there is only one self-consistent set of laws and constants. It has been the aim of some physicists to produce a theory of everything which calculates all the constants, and which also says that it doesn't matter how the universe started. It would end up the same with galaxies, stars, and life. It seems that M theory, which Hawking talks a lot about, was a, uh, which is a generalization of string theory, was originally designed with that in mind. But, in fact, that, that particular program seems highly implausible, given the different kinds of universe we can actually imagine. And in general, as we obtain better theories in physics, we do not eliminate free parameters. And indeed, M theory has made no observations and now, or made no predictions which can be observed. And uh, the turn in cosmology, including from Hawking, is towards a multiverse version of string theory, stroke M theory. Uh, so it seems to me that this multiverse idea is one you are virtually driven to if you are an atheist. And uh, Hawking certainly goes for it. But the idea is fraught with problems. First, the physics of multiverses is highly speculative. You wouldn't gain the impression from the Hawking and Melodinoff book that M theory had indeed made no predictions and there, were no, there was no observational or experimental support for it. It's highly speculative, and indeed uh, other universes than our own are unobservable in principle. Usually the idea is that there are infinitely many universes. Well, that very idea has certain problems associated with it. You cannot complete an infinity. You can always add to an infinity. So there can be no guarantee that all possibilities are covered, even if you have an infinite number of universes. There are paradoxes to do with human identity. This very room will be mimicked in um, uh, many, many other universes, possibly infinitely many universes, once you go into this realm of a multiverse. 
And uh, so it seems to me that uh, you're ending up with a, 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 a hypothesis which is um, perhaps giving rise to paradox. It's not a simple hypothesis, and scientists usually choose the simplest of competing hypotheses to explain any phenomenon. According to the principle of Occam's razor, one should not multiply entities unnecessarily, and the multiverse idea does that to the most extravagant degree. There is always the question, too, why this multiverse? In fact, what you've done is simply push the question back from why this universe is so special as to the why the multiverse is so special. There's a potential lack of predictability if we're in a multiverse. Uh, because there are far more disordered universes than ordered ones. And so why doesn't everything collapse into chaos uh, within the next uh, second or two? Perhaps the closest a multiverse explanation gets is to explaining the particular value, why the cosmological constant is so small. Because only if it is so small within quite a narrow range could galaxies and stars form, even though the theoretical value of that constant is 10 to the 120 power times bigger than that which is compatible with observation. But on the other hand, some kind of fine-tuning seems necessary in order to get an infinite universe in the first place, because mostly we're thinking about a multiverse being a gigantic overarching space-time in which the universes aren't really separate universes, but they're disconnected parts of this overarching space-time. Um, and you need the, the, the critical density over, of this whole um, vast overarching space-time to be lower than uh, it, to the actual density of this to be lower than a, the, than, a, than a certain critical value. Well, there's a big problem about the way the universe started, how highly ordered it was back at the beginning. There's a very strong argument of Roger Penrose to do with that, um, and yet. Um, what we would expect if we were in a multiverse would be not to be in a universe which is as ordered and structured to this day, uh, out as far as we can see to the furthest galaxy, but merely to exist in a, in a solar system which is just about ordered enough to it for us to exist, but that surrounded by chaos. Um, so uh, th th that seems a certain incompatibility with the idea of multiverses, the idea that we are in a highly ordered universe. Um, OK, so there are multiple problems with that idea. Again, you, you wouldn't get that impression from the Hawking and Milodinov book. And not only does the universe create itself, but uh, through M-theory and gravity, uh, a great many universes are created out of nothing. And as Professor Lane Craig has very well explained, uh, this isn't really creation out of what a philosopher would call nothing. So it seems to me that it's far simpler uh, far more rational to believe that the universe was created and designed by God than it is to invoke the enormously extravagant and speculative hypothesis of the multiverse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodney. Well, as we've got just a, a, a moment's time, I thought it might be interesting, Bill, just for a couple of minutes response to Rodney, if, if that's possible. Uh, to, to what? To, to what Rodney has had to a say. question or comment? Uh, just a comment on, on, on Rod, Rodney's All presentation right. there, and then we'll, we'll begin to take some questions. Is yes. that okay? Well, I appreciated very much the devastating critique of the use of the multiverse hypothesis to explain away fine-tuning. I counted no less than six objections uh, that Rodney uh, shared, and some of these are indeed, I think, very powerful. Uh, my only caveat, I think, Rodney, would be with respect to the doctrine of creation. It's certainly true that Christian theology distinguishes between, in Latin, creatio originans and creatio continuans, that is to say, originating creation and continuing creation. And I think that it's important that we not give up or compromise the emphasis on creatio originans, originating creation. And, and there's simply no need 
to back away from that to simply affirming that God conserves the universe in being moment by moment. We can affirm that and should, but it is an inherent part of the Christian doctrine of creation that the universe, the created world, had a, a beginning, that there is a state of affairs of the actual world which consists of God existing alone, and the universe comes into being uh, at the first moment of creation. So that would be my only reservation, is that um, as important as the contingency of the universe is and the contingency argument for God's existence, I wouldn't want us to back away from or soft pedal the idea of originating creation. I think this is not only part of Christian theology, but it's also inherent to the biblical concept of creation, as is evident from the very simple fact that creation in the Bible is always in past tense verbs. It's always God created, God did this. This is a temporal act, not simply a continuing act. So that would be my only uh, comment, I think, that I would want to make. Well, thank you both gentlemen. Um, it's worth noting at this point that uh, Stephen Hawking has been sent a copy of Bill's uh, speech that he gave and was invited to comment, but up until now hasn't chosen to do so. But um, he does have that if he chooses to read it and to respond to it at some point in the future. So um, if you'd like to come to the podium, Bill, and the first person would like to come forward with their question, do feel free. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, this is a very simple question. Uh, if God created everything, if God created the space-time continuum, what created God? Mm -hmm. Christians do not believe that God created everything. He created everything other than himself. He didn't create himself. So God is an uncreated being. As Rodney indicated so nicely in his speech, um, the concept of God that is traditional in Christian theology is that God is a necessary being, not a contingent being. That is to say, God exists in all possible worlds. It is metaphysically impossible that he fail to exist. So God is the uncaused, first cause of everything other than himself. It's not much of a definition for God. Well, I wasn't offering a definition of God. I was just offering one of the many attributes of God that uh, I would also say things like God is omnipotent, omniscient, um, exists self-existently, is eternal, uh, is morally perfect, uh, and so forth. There are many, many attributes that will round out and give you a very theologically rich concept of God. But it's important to see that in Christian thinking, traditionally, God isn't a contingent being. That is to say, a being that just happens to exist God just doesn't happen to exist. He's metaphysically necessary. He's a self-existent being. His existence, his non-existence is impossible. So that would answer the question then, well, what is God's cause or where did God come from? Christians don't believe that everything that exists has a cause because we think that God is, is uncaused and metaphysically necessary. In my arguments for the existence of God, I word the causal premise this way, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Anything that comes into being needs to have a cause, but an eternal, metaphysically necessary being is just uncaused. Yes, and very briefly, why do we care so much about God if there is such sentient suffering in the world? Well, that is uh, the $64,000 question, isn't it? The problem of evil and suffering in the world. And I, what I could say now would be, unfortunately very soundbite and inadequate, but basically what I would say is this, that while that is a tremendous emotional obstacle to believing in God, perhaps the most important emotional obstacle, when I think about it hard philosophically, it's very, very difficult to mount an argument against God's existence based on the suffering in the world. The atheist has to show that it's either impossible or highly improbable that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the suffering in the world. And we're simply not in a position to make those kind of judgments with any sort of confidence. Um, 
God's morally sufficient reasons for permitting some incident of suffering in your life might not emerge until centuries later, maybe in another country, so that you would have no hope of being able to see what his morally sufficient reason is for permitting this to enter your life. So it's simply impossible for us to make with any kind of confidence these sort of probability judgments when some incident of suffering occurs that God probably lacks a morally sufficient reason for allowing that. There's there, that's sheer speculation. And if I might just say, philosophers who are non-believers recognize this in other contexts. For example, one ethical theory that you often hear is called utilitarianism. Uh, one version of which says that we should take those actions that will bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Weigh your, your courses of action and, and take that action that will bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. And one of the most common and devastating critiques of utilitarian ethics is that we're simply not in a position to make that kind of calculation. What looks like a short-term uh, boon could turn out to be disastrous in the long run. And what looks like in the short term a horrible thing could turn out to redound to the great flourishing of mankind. And so one of the most common critiques, I think devastating critiques of utilitarian ethics is that we can't make that kind of judgment. And this, it's very similar with regard to evil and suffering. We're just not in a position to say it's improbable or impossible that God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing certain things to occur. Hi, thank you for what you've spoken tonight. Um, I'm not sure if I really understand it, but one of the authors had a, a I guess, a, the meta-ontological concerns that reality even exists. Is that kind of summarizing it? S sort of. What, what, at first they take the view that um, there really is no objective reality out there. It's kind of like saying it's all in your mind. But then they even go deeper and they say each person has his own reality. You create reality yourself. Yes, that, that's the view they actually espouse in the book. Well, I was just wondering, wouldn't it be simple enough just to drop a brick on their foot to demonstrate <laughs> the reality? I, I think that would probably do it for any common sense uh, individual. But as I say, for persons who are unaware of their own philosophical presuppositions and assumptions, um, they, they, they haven't thought these things through. In fact, they, they call their view a type of realism when in fact it's a radical anti-realism. But yeah, I, I think it, yes, I, I appreciate your commonsensical point. Hello, just a very easy question. Is there any empirical evidence for the existence of God? Is there an empirical evidence for the existence of God? I'll let Rodney say something about this as well, but this is the way I would put it. I would say there can be empirical evidence for a premise in an argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. Let me repeat that. There can be empirical evidence for a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. So one isn't postulating some sort of god of the gaps to fill up scientific gaps in our knowledge, but rather you're, we're, we're saying that there can be scientific empirical evidence for a premise in an argument that might lead to the conclusion that God exists. Let me give you an example. Take this argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore the universe has a cause. Now, the second premise, the universe began to exist, is, as I've argued tonight, a premise for which there is good scientific evidence. This is a statement that is religiously neutral and can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. It is a, a premise to which scientific or empirical evidence is, is relevant. And yet, in this philosophical argument, I think it does lead to a conclusion that has great theological significance. Right, it sounds to me a bit like you're just giving an argument, not real evidence. Uh, say it louder, please. It just sounds to me that you're giving just uh, an argument, not real evidence. I mean, when I, when I mean about evidence, it's just, you know, any facts, any, any physical, anything we can notice. I, I, the only thing I can say is you have got the belief 
but what you can argue that God exists. You haven't got really. You, there is not also a belief for God might not exist, but you can prove either side. You know. Well, I would invite you to think about the argument that I just gave. Just what begins mean, to maybe, exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. That leads to the existence of a being beyond the universe, and then we can deduce some of the theologically significant properties of this being. I, you may think I'm being overly subtle, but what I'm, I'm trying to do is avoid this common accusation of God of the gaps reasoning. Um, and I think that the way I've articulated is, is, is right, and there are good arguments for God's existence. But no I evidence. Hmm? But, but no evidence. There is yes, no evidence. the no. evidence is for the premises in the argument that leads logically to a conclusion that God exists. Let me give you another example, all right? The fine tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Number two, the fine tuning is not due to either physical necessity or chance. That's what Rodney argued tonight, from which it follows logically and inescapably, therefore, it is due to design. It's still that no is to say there's a cosmic designer of the universe. There is no evidence for fine tuning it anyway. Well, so, Rodney, no would you like to no address theories. that question? There's, there's no evidence for fine tuning. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of, uh, of uh, there are very, very many parameters which are fine tuned. I and mean, the classic example comes from Fred Hoyle, uh, who was an atheist and yet discovered that uh, uh, there's a, there's a, that there ha in order for uh, carbon and oxygen to be made inside stars, you need a certain balance of, of, of forces, you need a, a resonance in the uh, carbon atom and so on. And, and he was moved to, this atheist was moved to talk about a super intellect behind physics uh, and, 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 math and behind the universe essentially. There are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. And there are multiple, multiple examples of that kind. Now what I would say, I mean I would agree with uh, um, Professor Lane Craig, um, what, where you, you, I think you're, you're construing a very narrow meaning for evidence, you're, you're, the, the kind of evidence you find in the lab, okay? Well, what we're talking about is a comparison, not of different scientific hypotheses um, here, um, but we're, uh, different metaphysical hypotheses. So, um, uh, so we're asking a meta question here. We're not asking, uh, well, uh, what, are, what are the laws of nature and what do they describe and what predictions can we make of them? We're asking, why are the laws of nature the way they are? But there, uh, and and th that goes into a metaphysical argument of the kind that Professor Lane Craig wa was, was describing. But there are plenty of other kinds of evidence uh, for uh, the belief that we have as Christians. There's the evidence from religious experience. There's the evidence that we are in a universe that has moral What is moral religious values. experience? Sorry, what is religious experience? Well, it's a, a very, very, very widely and commonly shared um, that people experience a numinous presence. That, of course, all these things need to be unpacked and you need to go into the alternatives. Is it psychological? Uh, well, Isn't what, that what, supernatural what, evidence? Is it, yeah, is it, yeah, yeah. Um, most of the kinds of experiences in terms of religious experience that people have, uh, that, that you, can't dis, you can't demolish them any more than you can dis, demolish the idea that I'm speaking to you now. It's the same kind of... Same kind of we are going to have to move on, but thank yeah. you very but, much. But, but then you'd come yeah. to the empirical evidence to do with the, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, which is historical evidence. So there are other kinds of evidence... I would like to be proven that, by the way. Mm. Well, <laughs> come, come along on, on Monday evening yeah. in Southampton and you'll, you'll, you'll hear more about that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, would we have the next question? Thank you. Hello. Um, one Spencer coined the famous phrase, survival of the fittest. Now, I was pondering about this one day and I thought, if you expand it, you get survive, well, correct me if I've got this wrong, that's what I'm here for. I thought survival of the fittest to survive, or I thought you could expand it, those that survive are the fittest to survive. Now, it's self-evident there that you've got a self-defining statement, a circular logic, a truism. Now, I understand there's a basic law in science philosophy which states that for a theory to be valid, it must be inherently disprovable. Well, it seems to me that Spencer's phrase is just a piece of circular logic, so it breaks that maxim. Correct or not? 
Well, you're speaking of an area here where, frankly, uh, it's, not one, it's not an area that I deal in. You're talking about biological evolutionary theory. This is not a subject in which I'm competent to speak. I know that m many people have cre uh, criticized the notion of survival of the fittest for being tautological or circular yeah. in the way that you just described. On the other hand, I've seen statements by a number of evolutionary biologists who will dispense with that slogan and simply say that what the theory requires is that um, species which produce the uh, maximum number of offspring uh, are those that are most apt to survive so that they can get along without this sort of circularity. Um, but this isn't an area that that I have more than a layman's interest in. Rodney, is this something you'd like to speak to? Uh, I could br br briefly, but I, you know, I, I, I mean, Darwin, of course, spoke about natural selection. What we do have is the, the, the mechanism now for that. Uh, we have the, the combination of mutations of genes and so on, and selection by the environment. And that gives rise to uh, uh, better survival so as to reproduce, and it's reproductive success that's the key to evolution. Could I just add one little thing, though? Um, we, you talk about the survival of the fittest. I mean, Darwin's tree of life, as far as I'm aware, only shows divergent evolution. Now, isn't I'm correct in saying... I think you could forget the phrase. It was Herbert Spencer's phrase, not uh, Darwin's, uh, although I think he incorporated it into uh, later editions of The Origin, but it was not his phrase originally. Neither, in fact, was he, he only used the word evolved uh, once in the book, and that's, that was the last word of the book. So, I mean, you can get into a lot of misunderstanding about, uh, about evolution by, um, you know, picking up these, these phrases, I think. We, we will move on to our next question, but thank you very much. Uh, we'll have the next person at the microphone now. I think a lot of your argument for the existence of God is based to some extent on what you perceive as inconsistencies and problems with Hawking's view of the universe. And it stems back to what is called the Big Bang. But I think what Hawking's has possibly overlooked is there could have been more than one Big Bang. In fact, there could have been an indefinite sequence of Big Bangs. We would not be able to trace the existence of any of them except the last one in the part of the universe we live in. Yeah. Um, All right, that, I, sorry, that's not really a question. It's more of a statement of opinion. Yes, well, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I think you've misunderstood my intention this evening. Um, first, I wasn't arguing for the existence of God tonight. I wasn't giving an argument for God's existence. I was merely addressing the question, has Hawking eliminated the need for a creator? Has he eliminated God's existence? And my critique of Hawking was not at all based on inconsistencies in his model. Rather, what I looked at was the philosophical presuppositions and implications of the theory, but I'm assuming, for the sake of argument, that his theory is correct. That I'm, I'm, I'm granting that what his model says is correct, that time in the universe began at the South Pole, uh, and then asking the question, does that explain why the universe exists, why there's something rather than nothing, does it explain why the universe came into being? And my answer to those questions is no, the model doesn't even address those questions. So I'm not at all criticizing Stephen Hawking's model. My bone to pick with him are the philosophical implications and assumptions that he makes, whereby he tries to use the model to eliminate theism. I think if this model is true, it fairly cries out for theism because it does posit an absolute beginning of the universe. Not an infinite cycle of universes prior to this, but an absolute beginning of time in the universe. So whether the model is correct is, is for the physicists to decide, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming for the sake of argument tonight that it is correct and simply arguing that it, far from eliminating the need for a creator, it, it fairly impels us to it. Well, it seems that the the possibility of multiple Big Bangs is easier to believe in than multiverses. Than yeah. multiverse? Yeah. yeah, because... Well, of course, yeah, the question of believability, I, we have to be very careful here. If you look at the article that I wrote with physicist James Sinclair in the Blackwell Companion for Natural Theology on 
the cosmological argument for God's existence. My colleague, James Sinclair, does a very nice survey of contemporary cosmology and all the competing alternatives to the Hawking model that, are, that, is, that is mentioned in this book. And what he shows is that these cyclical models face all kinds of difficulties that make them impossible to extrapolate to past infinity. Even given these sort of cyclical uh, models, they can't be extrapolated to an eternal past. And in fact, one of the problems with them is precisely the fine tuning. In order to go through an infinite series of cycles to arrive at today would require infinitely precise fine tuning of the universe uh, to exhibit that kind of a behavior. So it would fairly throw you into the fine tuning argument of Rodney Holder. Did you want to comment at all on that anymore? Yeah, um, just, just, I, I, again, just briefly. Yes, I mean, that is a problem. The, thermo, the, the, the um, initial entropy of the universe uh, is, is a problem because uh, this universe started off highly ordered. And, and, and if you have a big crunch, there's an asymmetry because you go to a highly disordered universe. So your next bounce is, is highly disordered, even if you've got a finite universe which is um, you know, expanding and contracting anyway rather than an infinite one. So. Uh, all kinds of problems associated with the cyclic universe model um, th uh, uh, in, in that form, at any rate. Thank you very, very much for the question. Very interesting. Uh, our next questioner, please. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> as you said, like earlier, um, as God is, if God is benevol benevol benevolent and omnipotent, then why, in your utilitarian model, why must a few suffer? Why are we in that position to begin with? Why what to begin with? So, as you say, like, my understanding of Utilitarianism is, say, there's two tracks, and we must diverge the train onto the track which the, few must, the fewer must suffer, then why are we on this position in the first place as such? So why must a few say, like, be, yeah. why must a few suffer in well, the long scheme? In, in the, if he's in truly the Christian view, um, God has chosen to create a world with a free agents who can fr freely choose either to obey or to disobey him. And evil ultimately enters into the universe God has made through the free choices of creatures. Uh, and free will is a good thing. That's a, that's a good thing to have, but it involves the inherent uh, possibility that these creatures may not do good, they may not act in conformity with God's will, but may freely turn away from it. And that brings evil into the world. But surely that's contrary to the fact that he's benevolent, if he's knowingly letting us suffer. Yeah, I don't think it is contrary to the fact of being benevolent, because he, he wants to have free creatures who are genuine moral agents rather than robots and puppets. It would be an exercise in futility for God to make a puppet world where there's no freedom, and then to say to these creatures, do you love me, and then pull the strings, and they say, yes, God, we love you, such a world would be meaningless. So it seems to me that the gift of free will is a tremendous act of benevolence on God's part, and it's our fault that we misuse it. It's not his fault. Fortunately, in the Christian view, God has done something about this, namely, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for the, the sin of mankind so that we can experience God's forgiveness and moral cleansing and eternal life. So God is in, in the, uh, the business of, of reclaiming lost sinners and setting things right again, and ultimately he will. So, but as you said, it almost sounds like we're here for his entertainment. We're here for his entertainment? Yeah, because you said no. that. No, 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 no. So no. he lets us suffer to Do, make it more interesting? You remember, no, the, the uh, <laughs> God, being supremely perfect and self-existent, has no needs. We shouldn't think of God, as one British journalist said, as a sort of chap. Uh, God is not a chap. Uh, and, and he has no needs, and particularly no need of us, in order to be happy. What that means is that the only possible motivation for create a, creation could be for the benefit of the creatures themselves. Namely, God has created us so that we can have the awesome joy of being related and knowing him as the source of supreme, infinite goodness 
and love and to enjoy him for eternity. Um, so that the act of creation is itself an, a tremendous act of grace and benevolence because it's all for us. It's for our sake and not for his own. So if you're still thinking in terms of God creating us for his entertainment, your, your God is too small. That's, that's so far from the Christian concept of God as to be a travesty. We, we are gonna have to move on, but thank you. Another very interesting set of questions there. Thank you very much for your presentation, your, your lecture this evening, I appreciate that. I think uh, the concept of multiverse may have been seen or may be seen as, as an escape route for, for some atheists from their philosophical quandary, if I, if I get you right. I, I don't want to psychoanalyze physicists and talk about their motivations. I, I don't think that's wise or necessary. I think these theories can be weighed by the evidence and judged accordingly, and we can prescind from psychoanalyzing the motivations that might lie behind their formulators. So I, I, I don't make a judgment like that. Point, point taken. Um, could I then dare to suggest that maybe we are in danger through the attempt to prove them wrong in this concept, in danger of limiting our view of God's infinite creativity. Mm. Because I think they are trying to think outside the box. They've got themselves sure. boxed in, and they're trying to think outside the box. Fair enough. And I, and I would like to posit the existence of other universes beyond our relatively small and relatively short-lived universe. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll let Rodney say something about that in, in a second, but... Um, <laughs> I think that theism is really the only hope for the multiverse hypothesis. I really do. Look at Rodney's criticisms of the multiverse hypothesis. For example, these problems of predictability that Roger Penrose talks about, um, or why this multiverse, there, there it needs to be fine tuning of the multiverse producing uh, mechanism. Uh, things of this sort. I think can only be solved by positing theism. Namely, there is a God who has created a multiverse. And, I'm right, he wa and I'm right there with you in that. I'm just suggesting that okay. our creator God probably did other things before our universe existed. Well, see, and is probably I, I in the rest of eternity yeah, going to do some probably. other creative things which we cannot in our tiny uh -huh. minds imagine as yet. I think he could have, but I'm reluctant to use the word probably because I don't think we have any evidence to, to allow us to use the word probably that he did these things. But I, I do want to affirm what you're saying is that on naturalism, I think it's highly probable there's no multiverse. But if theism is true, then I think you've got to be open to the multiverse hypothesis in a new way. And I'd like to hear what Rodney has to say about that. Well, yes, I broadly agree with that. Now, there, are, there are a number of uh, uh, theologians and um, uh, indeed, cosmologists, um, uh, Christian cosmologists, um, who are in favor of a multiverse. So one would be Don Page, evangelical Christian, colleague of Stephen Hawking, written papers with him, he's in favor of a multiverse. Um, the late Arthur Peacock, who was a pioneer of the science religion discussion, in favor of a multiverse in principle, because, he said, because the important thing is that uh, uh, the, the, the multiverse brings about cognizing subjects somewhere within it, within some, some sub-member. I, I, I think what I'm suspicious of is the, 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 the multiverse models that are on, that are, that are on offer, uh, where the, uh, it, it seems to be that the vast majority of these universes are completely dead and boring, and um, uh, you may get universe-generating mechanisms, uh, but I, have, I, I, I would also have sympathy with what um, the theologian Keith Ward says here, that uh, a multiverse is fine in principle, but God would only create universes that are better to exist than not, and so therefore that uh, where uh, the good uh, far outweighs the evil. Uh, and it's not clear, um, you know, once you go down this route with the kind of models that are on offer, that, 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 that any... That, 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 universes with overwhelming evil would be excluded. So I, I, I would want to, if you come back to this as, uh, as a theologian or a, a, a Christian believer, um, 
rather than simply as a cosmologist, then you start to go down the route that Professor Craig is saying, and, and, but, and we envisage, well, what kinds of universe would God create? And is that the same kind of thing as, that's being offered by, by the cosmologists? I'm not sure it is. I think my question is, why would we want to limit the yeah. sort of universes that God wants to create oh, if well, he I is infinite and sure. eternal, sure. then time is on his side. Sure, ab absolutely. I, 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 I totally take that point. But he would not create universities that have overwhelming preponderances of evil. I think that's, that would be a limitation of the, the kind of God I believe in. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those very interesting questions again. But I, I would add, too, I'm, I don't think time is on God's side, I, because I think God created time uh, along with space, and therefore these are creations of God, not something that is co-eternal with him. Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Um, I want to ask a question about the, um, the repeated and somewhat surreptitious movement that's been made tonight between the deistic and the theistic. And I'd like to do that with reference to the quotation that's been thrown around, um, something from nothing. Uh, I'll start, it's two parts. The first part is on the something. Um, you mentioned that um, we have the creation of life, and life is possible in a universe. But how come uh, life is supposedly created and so bountiful that it can only exist on Earth, one small hamlet of universe, of the universe, and then only on parts of the Earth? Most of the Earth, of course, is climatically inhospitable. Uh, so <laughs> how comes it? Um, the second part is with reference to the nothing. Um, if you look in the night sky, um, possibly with a telescope, though I think it's possible with the naked eye, you can see the Andromeda galaxy, which is, according to people who are far better versed in science than I, uh, on a direct collision course with our solar system in about five million years' time, so there's no need to panic about it tonight. But when that does get here, there's an awful lot of nothingness coming. So the second part of that question is, is that part of a design? Is nothingness inbuilt? in the something design. All right, I'll say something briefly about this and then hand it over to Rodney again. Um, <laughs> first, um, I don't think either Rodney or I um, is committed to saying that life only exists here on Earth. I, I, I'm certainly open to the idea that there's extraterrestrial life uh, throughout the universe. I, I have no idea. Again, I think that theism provides the best chance for that to happen. It, it's on naturalism that is so highly, highly improbable that there would be intelligent life anywhere else in the cosmos. But on theism, God could have created it anywhere. Let me finish my answer before you respond. So I, I'm not committed to saying there's life only here on Earth. But in any case, the, the, uh, even life here just on this planet does still require the sort of fine tuning that Rodney Holder described of the entire cosmos. So that the size of the cosmos is really a function of its expansion and the time needed, for example, to cook up the heavy elements in the stars of which our bodies and life is composed. So the, the, the vastness of the universe really could be just for our sake alone in order to get those heavy elements that are necessary for us to exist. Now with regard to the nothingness, again here, you say nothingness is coming. The, let's, when I'm using the word nothing, I'm using this in the proper philosophical sense of non-being, uh, not like empty space or, or vacuum or something of that sort. So um, I, I don't think we should talk about nothingness is coming unless you mean that we're going to cease to exist, and, and I think that is a prediction of physics. What has happened in recent years is that the theological field called eschatology, which is the study of the end times, the last things, eschatology has now become a field of physics. Cosmology or cosmogony studies the origin of the universe Physical eschatology studies the ultimate fate of the universe. And what uh, physical eschatology says is the universe is on its way toward thermodynamic destruction, that all life, light, and heat will dissipate and disappear, and ultimately the universe will bring about the extinction 
of all humanity. It, it, it underlines, I think, the futility of existence if there is no God. The, the picture painted by naturalism is very, very grim. But physical eschatology concerns what will happen in the future if God does not intervene to change things first. Cosmogony is historical science. It describes what has actually happened. Eschatology is merely projections based upon current laws and conditions. But if God were to intervene, then in fact the thermodynamic destruction of the universe never will take place. And as Christians, we believe that in fact God will bring about the end of this universe, not thermodynamic extinction, and that he will do so while there is still life on this planet. On what authority do you claim that? On the authority of Jesus of Nazareth. I'd like to refer you then to the first point you made about the possibility that okay, you're let me quite just open say, to them. Well, let me just add one thing. One might say, well, why believe what Jesus of Nazareth said? And I would say on the basis of, as Rodney indicated, his resurrection from the dead. My theological doctorate at the University of Munich was done on the resurrection narratives of the New Testament. And I think we have very good historical grounds for believing that this event really happened and that therefore God has revealed to us his plan for the future of the universe and has given us a basis for hoping and thinking that it will not lead ultimately to human extinction. There's, there was a great deal of extrapolation in that last point. Um, first of all, that you can predict what's going to happen on the basis of uh, one book. And if I could just, what I was about to say about aliens is that you say that there could be extraterrestrial life. Yeah. Again, what do you base that on? If you can base something, i.e., if you can base God intervening to stop the end of the universe on a book. Yeah. <laughs> now, I haven't read the entire Bible, but there's not that many mention or many mentionings of extraterrestrial life. Again, where do you get this from? If you get it from Well, I, I get it from the power of God. If he can create life on this planet, I assume he could do it elsewhere. But I don't believe that there is extraterrestrial life. You asked, I, I said, I don't exclude it. You said, do you think, uh, are you saying there's only life here on earth? No, I'm not asserting that. I'm open. I'm saying I'm open-minded. Isn't this wonderful? You know, as a Christian, you see, I can be open-minded about all these issues because I've got an omnipotent God who could do these things if he wants. And so the only way to tell is to look at the evidence and see if he's done it. And, and as yet, of course, as you know, we don't have any evidence of extraterrestrial life, but I'm completely open to our finding it. Let me ask Rodney if he has anything to say about that. Well, <laughs> No, to be honest, I'm not sure I do have much to add to that because I think we really are singing the same hymn sheet here. You, you mentioned the size of the universe, which is necessary for us to come into existence, for life anywhere in the universe to come into existence. The size and age of the universe need to be what they are. That's one of the fine tunings. And then this whole question of eschatology, um, well, uh, on a cosmic time scale, it will be tens of billions of years before the, the heat, final heat death of the universe. Um, but uh, like uh, Professor Lane Craig, I base my belief on the resurrection of Jesus Christ for which there is powerful evidence, uh, evidence of the testimony of uh, witnesses. Go, you read 1 Corinthians 15, you can track back what St. Paul is describing there when he describes a whole sequence of witnesses and then to himself and his meeting with the apostles and so on and his own experience. Um, I, I, I think that's, that's immensely powerful, and, and uh, you say you've got the empty tomb, the, the appearances, the fact that the um, uh, women were the first, uh, first on the scene, the first witnesses, which uh, is simply something you wouldn't invent in the first century, because, sad to say, women were not deemed reliable in court and so on. So I base what God is doing, going to do with the universe on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his, 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 his appearances. I'm sure you want to come back, but we are going to have to move to another question. Go ahead. Um, just firstly, I'd like to say thank you. Um, I teach RE, and it's very rare that I get the opportunity to um, speak to someone who we actually refer to in lessons. All the philosophers and theologians tend to be dead. So, um, <laughs> I'm very pleased. <laughs> um, I'd just like to just share a couple of observations and just ask your thoughts on if I'm on the right tracks and whether there's anything you've noticed with these. Um, just reading from the book, it says... Um, what page? 
Uh, well, this is the paperback, but it's 226. I don't know if it's, it's, the, it it's the last I, I chapter. The oh, it's different pagination. Uh, sorry, the Stephen Hawking. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he says, uh, how can a whole universe be created from nothing? That is why there must be a law like gravity. And I was struck by the phrase, there must be, because that kind of, to me, makes me think of ne necessity. Yes. And it seems almost like um, Hawking has replaced Aquinas' necessary being with gravity, or gravity is the necessary being, it must be. And when I began thinking about that, I thought, well, if you think about what gravity does, it holds everything together, it is there in every single atom, in the whole of the universe, it's almost omnipresent, and it creates the universe according to Hawking. I was struck by how that almost seems like a spiritual answer that he's giving, that actually, although he's not using the word God, he's replaced it with gravity, it's almost a spiritual answer, it's almost a kind of form of um, pantheism. I just wondered whether that was something whether I'm on the right lines or whether I'm making this up. Yeah, I, I think you're reading between the lines okay. there, quite honestly. For Hawking, gravity is a purely physical force. It has finite power. Um, it comes into being at the beginning of the universe, at the South Pole on his model. It's a physical entity. But I think what you're, you're right in saying that it does kind of serve in a way as a God surrogate in that he's trying to explain why is there something rather than nothing? And his answer is that given quantum physics and gravity, this explains why there's something rather than nothing. And the point I think that we need to say is no, it doesn't, uh, as I've tried to show tonight, it doesn't serve that successful role as a God surrogate at all. So I, in that sense, I think that's right, but I wouldn't spiritualize it from his point of view. Uh, thank you very much for your talk tonight. Um, I'd like to uh, say that uh, it seems to me that um, initially uh, you speak about why is there something rather than nothing. It suggests to me that uh, philosophically uh, the answer lies for you in the will of God, ultimately, um, for creation. Um, so essentially I want to ask a question which I need you to decide whether it's theological or, or philosophical. but. Um, you speak of uh, free will, and free will seems to be fundamental to the Christian notion of creation, to the Christian experience following creation. I'd just like to ask, seeing as uh, each person has an existence brought into, uh, into being by God and the will of God um, and God's creative act, um, and free will is so fundamental to God's act uh, of creation, that initial bringing into being is a, com a compulsory existence. So in terms of uh, every person's existence and the fact that it is uh, morally accountable, could you just ex uh, say something about uh, your philosophical position in terms of God's creative act and the bringing into being of uh, morally accountable, uh, uh, what should we say, uh, creatures yes. that uh, are therefore accountable but are compulsorily existing? All right, let me try to address that. First, the, the way in which we have tried to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is not by an appeal to God's will. Rather, the appeal is to God himself as a metaphysically necessary being. The reason that there is something rather than nothing is because there is a metaphysically necessary being whose non-existence is impossible, a being who exists in all possible worlds. So the word something here doesn't mean just the universe. The reason the universe exists, yes, is because of the will of God, but the reason anything exists is because there is a metaphysically necessary being, which is God himself. And then you're quite right. In Christian theology, creation is a freely willed choice of God. He did not have to create. He was under no compulsion or obligation to create. Creation is a free act of God. He brought the universe into being uh, without any material cause. Uh, now, you're also, I think, right in saying that we didn't ask to be created. And in that sense, we do find ourselves thrust into existence. Um, there is that sort of compulsion, as you put it. I didn't ask to be born. I just find myself here, and this is a profound philosophical question that many philosophers have struggled with, why do I exist? And the answer, I think, is quite right, that God has created me. He has decided 
that I should exist and has put me into existence. And so I do find myself, in a sense, thrust into being, here I am, now what am I going to do with my life? And as you also indicated, God has created you as a moral agent. That is to say, you have the freedom to make morally significant choices in a way that mere animals do not. And therefore, you are morally accountable to God as a holy and just creator for the way you choose to live your life. And the sad news is that all of us have failed to live up to his holy and moral standards we have in various ways said or thought or done um, things that are evil, that are contrary to God's will. And as a result, we find ourselves in need of his grace and forgiveness and moral uh, reformation in our lives. And that gets into then the whole Christian gospel of redemption and salvation through Christ, who is God's provision for our sin. But all of this is based upon the idea that we are, as you say, morally significant agents capable of free, freely choosing to obey or to disobey God. Mm. Um, thank you. Um, I'm not trying to raise this as any proof uh, against any of the uh, claims for God's existence, but I am, as a philosopher, of, uh, also a teacher, essentially. Um, yes. Often uh, in conversation with students who may come across Dostoevsky's uh, telling uh, novel, uh, which brings to the point this situation of somebody as if they've given, been given by God a ticket to existence. And uh, in a sense, they want to return the ticket. How come? Um, and I know that this is uh, essentially, it sounds very ungrateful, but it is an ethical issue uh, and yes. a philosophical issue that uh, raises the question of the irreversible nature of those significant moral choices we make, which we didn't instigate. Ah. Uh, so I wondered if uh, you could say, how might I tell my students, for example, that God is not just that he has the power or the authority. I don't think we need to question that if we take God as a necessary being that has authority. Yes. But the question is, in a sense, how can God uh, hold to account and uh, ultimately uh, make people uh, or expect people to pay for their actions that they didn't uh, ask. Can I give you a very naive analogy? Uh, and possibly the analogy will fail. Mm -hmm. um, but if, for example, uh, you as a child were uh, asked to enter an egg and spoon race, in fact, put into an egg and spoon race, uh, maybe you don't have these in America, but uh, we suffer these things in England, um, some kind of... Um, arbitrary and possibly uh, non-necessary race for uh, maybe uh, a reason that you've no idea yourself. As a child, you enter a race, you put into it, and you fail the race and you suffer some punishment. Um, there's a sense in which we would regard that as unjust. How might I tell my students it's not unjust for, bring, for God to bring us into being uh, and to make us accountable for our being. All right, well, there's a number of levels on which you can answer that question. First of all, I would argue that it makes no sense to even talk about justice apart from God and his commands. Our moral obligations, I think, are constituted by God's commands to us. So that it's, uh, the very concept of, of justice means something that is in accord with the will and commands of a holy, and loving God. So the very concept of justice, I think, is rooted in God and his commands. I think the other thing to keep in mind that these students may not appreciate is what I said to the other questioner earlier tonight, and that is that creation is a tremendous gift. It is for our benefit. We are being given the opportunity to come into relationship with infinite goodness and love, the source of all moral value whatsoever. To know God is an incommensurable good. That is to say, there's literally nothing that can be compared to it. Finite goods cannot even be compared to the infinite good of knowing God. So that those of us who have been created out of, out of all the possible individuals God have, could have created are the beneficiaries of an indescribable gift, the gift of existence and the chance to know God, infinite goodness and love forever. And, and, and that's why 
they shouldn't want to return the ticket. They should be rejoicing in their good fortune that God has chosen to create them and give them this unspeakable gift. Thank you. Um, can I just ask one okay. brief thing? Um, I understand that you're not, uh, in giving me that answer uh, for my students, um, speaking of divine command theory, in the sense that we're not saying God's justice or God's moral uh, uh, sort of framework is, is basically because of God's command, because of his power. Could you Not because clarify? of his power, but I, I am a divine command theorist. Very briefly, I would say that good and evil are determined by God himself. God is the paradigm of good. He is kind, loving, fair, impartial, compassionate, and so forth. So that God himself is the paradigm of goodness. And then this goodness is expressed toward us in the form of divine commandments, which constitute our moral duties. And these commandments are not arbitrary, they are expressions of his own moral character. And, and uh, therefore, God is not capricious uh, in any way. Rather, his commandments uh, reflect his own perfect goodness. So I am a divine command theorist, but not a voluntarist. I don't think he just makes up moral values. They reflect his essential properties. I appreciate your answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final question, I think, <laughs> and uh, we should be able to finish by 9.30 with this final question. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. It's a wonderful talk that you gave this evening. Uh, my question is, to quote a proverb, the heart of the problem is the heart of man. Isn't it true that we're so quick to question God when we see suffering and when we see evil in the world, but yet, why, why don't we stop to think of our taste buds when we bite into an apple? Why don't we stop to think about the freedom that we have? Why don't we stop to think about the clothing that we wear and the, the warmth that we have and air conditioning and all the wonderful things that we have? Why are we so quick to look at the glass being half empty like, God, yeah. you're so terrible up there. Yeah. Isn't it something to do with our hearts? I think you're right, Ralph. I think the atheist kind of tries to put the theist in a no-win position. Namely, when things are going badly, People say, where is God? Look how rotten and bad things are. When things are going great, then people say, well, I don't need God. I can get along quite fine without him. And so, you know, here in the indulgent Western world of Europe and North America, people are, do just fine in our comfy, cushy lives. And rather than give thanks to God and praise him for this, they just sort of get along happily without him. Um, and it's really in, in Africa, Latin America, Asia, and countries that have experienced terrible war, poverty, famine, that the growth rates of Christianity are most dramatic. So I think you're on to something there. Uh, we, we fail to have grateful hearts many times and become self-indulgent rather than giving praise and glory to God for the good things he's given us. Yes, I know for myself that I can go through an entire day and have people be very nice to me, very polite, and it takes one person just to blindside <laughs> me, and it will ruin my whole day. I'll forget about the 25 people who were good to me, and I'll yeah. just focus on that one person. It just destroys my whole attitude. Yeah, and that's a mis misbalanced uh, set of priorities. Yes, you have yeah. to be ready for those yes. moments. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>